It has become a popular joke that everything in Australia wants to kill you. The continent holds 21 of the top 25 deadliest snakes in the world and 520 species of venomous spiders, many of which are extremely dangerous. Lethal jellyfish, shellfish, and cephalopods patrol the shores alongside sharks, while gigantic saltwater crocodiles now stalk inland waterways. Natural elements like the heat and the tide claim their fair share of victims, too. Even cute and cuddly critters like koalas and kangaroos can display a nastier side when provoked. As frightening as these animals may be, none really want to kill you for the sport of it. Anyone who meets their untimely end from these animals was either perceived as a meal or a threat. Nothing personal. The same cannot be said, however, for some of Australia's stranger residents. If the stories are to be believed, there are plenty of beasts in the wilderness who display unwarranted aggression towards human beings. Beast which seems to have stepped out right of our nightmares. The Australian outback is most famous for its sparsely populated desert terrain. However, other lusher parts of the countryside remain equally untamed to this day, because 17% of the continent is covered in forest, making Australia the country with the seventh largest forested area in the world. These encompass a wide variety of biospheres, from the rainforest of New South Wales to Pilaga, a semi-arid woodland in New South Wales. The rich diversity of these forests is reflected in the wide variety of the flora and fauna they support, which might include something more sinister than expected. Australia's forests are famous among cryptozoologists as one of the best places in Australia to run into the island nation's most famous monster, the Yowie. Along the Newell Highway in Palaga, for example, truck drivers once erected signs reading, Beware of Yowies, next 121 kilometers. And more than a few truckies have had encounters with the beast or seen their ominous tracks trailing into the bush from the dusty roadside. In 1979, a Constable Wern of the Kunabiara brand police told reporters that he had even heard of a truck driver returning from Queensland who drove more than 30 miles with two flat tires because he was simply so afraid to stop in Yaomi territory. The trucky fear was fueled by stories like the ones Warren had collected from other truck drivers. Warren claimed to have spoken with another man who, while sleeping in his cab along the side of the road, was awoken by a violent thumping noise. He was too afraid to go investigate and, instead, drove as fast as he could to the town of Nurabri. Once he arrived, he found the running boards pulled from his truck. So strong were truckers' fears that, during the 1979 blockades to protest heavy government fines and high fuel prices, no drivers dared to block passage through the Palaga. No one wanted to be stuck in gridlock with an angry Yowie at their door. Like other eyewitnesses, truckies who lay eyes upon Yowie uniformly describe it as a tall, hairy being who leaves behind massive human-like footprints wherever it goes. They are essentially an almost perfect match for their North American counterpart, the Bigfoot or Sasquatch of Canada and the United States. Both Bigfoot and Yowies display an affinity for throwing stones, making loud wood knocks in the forest, and allegedly smell horrible. Tales abound of Yowies abducting women and children, just as Bigfoot do in indigenous North American tribal belief. Like Bigfoot, Yowies strike fear in the hearts of dogs and are often blamed for the unexplained deaths of livestock and pets combined. On August 10, 1977, a woman in Woodenbong, Queensland, was roused from sleep by the sharp yelps of her dog in distress. She stepped out her back door and was alarmed by what greeted her a foul-smelling ape man standing only five feet away. Her helpless canine held tight against its chest, and the beast stood there six feet tall and sported an undersized head set atop a pair of broad shoulders. Luckily, the Yowie seemed to share her surprise, dropping the pet before slowly backing away, but never breaking eye contact. The creature grunted deeply several times before running into the street its arms flailing loosely as it entered the darkness on the other side. When she retrieved her pet, the witness was hit by the beast's revolting odor yet again. During its brief struggle with the yaoi, the creature's stench had infused itself into the dog's coat. 
The witness had to resort to scrubbing her pet with antiseptic wash to fully rid the smell. In the coming days, proof of her encounter would emerge. Long, red-colored hair was discovered clinging to a fence post. In her yard, the creature had left behind a solitary footprint eight and a half inches long by four inches wide. A little over two months later, 20 students, including a future senator, were staying near Springbrook, Queensland, when a yowie approached their cabin. It seemed to stand an imposing nine feet tall, plucking three foot tall shrubs out of the ground like they were blades of grass. Over the course of their stay, the students saw the creature both at a distance through their binoculars as well as at a close range when the yowie approached within 30 feet of their cabin. Narrow-heeled footprints measuring 13 inches long, 7 inches wide at the toes, were actually found crisscrossing the property afterward, and sightings in the area had persisted through the coming year. Encounters with the Yowies stretched back well before European colonization, all into Aboriginal folklore. The name may originate in the Uwilarai term, Yui, meaning dream spirit. In the earliest Aboriginal glossaries compiled by settlers, the term Yowie was defined as either this dream spirit or as a ghost, sometimes understood by tribes as a shaggy beast with a human-like face and feet, which were often oriented backwards. Europeans making their home in Australia embraced the name Yowie when describing these tall, hairy humanoids alongside their other terms like the Australian bush ape, hairy man, or related indigenous words specific to the region. Plenty of Yowie encounters describe these creatures as overly aggressive, intimidating, or even attacking eyewitnesses, a quality shared with North America's Bigfoot. A 23-year-old Queensland witness, let's call her Taylor, discovered this firsthand in August of 1990. It was around 4 in the afternoon when Taylor decided to summit Red Hill near Bayview Heights in Wari, which is a suburb of Cairns, or as the locals say, Cairns. She wanted to exercise, but was looking for a new place that she hadn't been before. Red Hill was the perfect place for a power walk, with its multiple picturesque tracks, and before long, Taylor had parked her car beside the Catholic school at the base of the hill. Shortly after beginning her walk up the northeastern side, Taylor noticed another man, a figure walking a little over 50 yards ahead of her. She followed the man most of the way, occasionally losing sight of him due to the tall grass along the way. And within 10 minutes, they had near the top of Red Hill where the trailway split to either reach the top or take down another route. Now, Taylor watched as the man took the latter path and being unfamiliar with the area, she continued to follow him. As she did so, she glanced to her right to see if anybody was coming from the summit and the last thing she needed was to get in the way of a jogger or a bike rider careening down the hill. That is when she saw it, something Taylor described as a hairy man. Her height, or only a little bit shorter, leaning out from the tall grass no more than a hundred feet away. At first, Taylor thought it was a person. I mean, after all, it was so human-like, but the hair all over its body ruled that out. And from what she could tell, the creature was entirely covered in this shaggy black reddish fur with only a little bit of exposed skin around its chest area and on its human-like face. Her next thought was that it was a person in a gorilla costume. But who in their right mind would be atop the hill dressed like that? And for what reason? What's more is the thing's legs were massive, as were its arms. They were bigger than her own legs and extended far below the creature's knees on either side of its body. Each ended in hands twice the size of a full-grown man's. The beast masculature was almost comically developed, comparable, in Taylor's mind, to the rippling muscles of Arnold Schwarzenegger. When she first saw it, the creature's eyes were locked upon the man Taylor had been following. When it noticed her presence, the Yowie seemed surprised. However, this surprise quickly boiled to a simmering anger as the beast stood to its full height glaring at her. It seemed absolutely livid that she had spotted it. Without averting its gaze, the Yowie clenched its fist two or three times, each accompanied by rippling chest muscles, a snarling expression, and an earth-shaking growl. No gorilla suit could do that, Taylor realized. 
And after several moments, the crescendo of the growls rolled into a full-fledged roar, deep and guttural. Only about 15 seconds had passed since Taylor had caught sight of the beast. It just attacked me, she later told the Australian Yowie Research Group. It leaned way forward as it leapt off towards me. I know people lean forward when they start to run, but this thing leaned right down. It didn't look right. It wasn't the way we would run. But I only saw it take the first two or three strides and just turned and ran. Taylor wasted no time, immediately fled downhill, calculating the consequences of a sprained ankle or a broken bone as far more acceptable than whatever the creature had in mind for her. She was only a handful of strides into her descent before she was launched off her feet from a blow to her back. It felt like the Yowie had punched or pushed her with both of its hands. A Taylor flew off the side of Red Hill, luckily landing in the tall grass, which helped break her fall. Taylor continued to tumble down the slope, and as her momentum faded away, she continued to force her body to roll downhill, leaving her covered in leaves and dirt and completely disoriented. When Taylor finally dared to look up, she was at the bottom of Red Hill. She could see a fence nearby, and it bordered the property of the Catholic school where she had parked her car. If there was any chance of escaping the Yowie, this was it. Taylor stumbled to her feet and vaulted the fence into the adjacent field, crossing the schoolyard as fast as she could. She never chanced another look behind her and simply kept running until she reached the safety of her car. This stays with me every day, she said, adding that. It was quite a large hill with a steep slope. I was really quite lucky there was a long, tall grass to break my fall. Had Taylor interrupted a Yowie stalking its prey? Despite their overwhelming similarity, Yowies are not always a perfect match for Bigfoot. Unlike Bigfoot, Yowie footprints sometimes display toes slightly disproportionate to their feet, occasionally longer than would be expected. In one of the earliest historical encounters, George Osborne saw a Yowie descend a tree in Avondale, New South Wales, in April of 1871. The creature seemed quite ape-like, with one curious exception. Osborne compared its feet to those of an iguana's. Yowies also rarely reach the same monstrous heights reported in American Bigfoot encounters. Yowies rarely seem to exceed 7 feet tall, although a few have been reported as standing as high as 11 feet. In 1974, New South Wales witness Alwyn Richards claimed that he and his sister watched a Yowie as it stared at them near Kilawara. It stood 9 feet tall, allowing it to easily step over a 4 foot tall fence without breaking its stride. There also exist a handful of accounts featuring short yaois comparable to stories of Littlefoot or indigenous American legends of little people. In 1979, the former gold mining town of Charters Tower in Queensland was shaken by reports of a short hairy beast that had attacked locals. In the middle of the night, on April 29th, police intercepted a youth running down Rainbow Road. When they stopped to ask what the matter was, the youth man looked like he had seen a ghost. Charters Towers Police Sergeant Gil Engler told reporters that the 19-year-old Michael Mangan was absolutely inconsolable when he had arrived at the station. According to Michael, he and his friends had been seeing strange shapes for months in the brush atop Towers Hill, which overlooks the community. Michael's first sighting had occurred half a year earlier, I was parked on the hill with my girlfriend one night, he claims. I looked across to the passenger side of the car and saw a black hairy face at the window. It was awful. The face was small and drawn black like that of an ape. We both screamed. I started the car to get out of place and this thing raised its hand and smashed the passenger side window. According to Michael, they kept the entire incident quiet, certain that no one would believe them. He even went as so far to repair the window himself. Michael swore off any return to Towers Hill that night, a promise he failed to keep. Six months later, his friends had goaded him into returning, hoping they could all catch a glimpse of this horrid imp. For 300 feet, the youths struggled up the hill, ever on the lookout for the old mining shafts which pockmarked their ascent. Along the way, one of their number lost his way. Michael and the rest of the group were about to mount a search when they heard screams for help echoing across the darkness. 
Michael ran back to town, half to get help and half out of sheer terror, and it was shortly thereafter that he ran into the police. Luckily, the victim survived and made his way back to town as well, where he was also interviewed at the police station. The officers found the young man disheveled but unarmed with a large blood stain across the leg of his pants and a wild tale to tell. According to Michael's friend, he had barely escaped with his life that night. After becoming separated from the group, a short hairy monster around three feet tall had emerged from the bush and attacked him. Michael's friend had managed to fight off the creature with a stone, wounding it and causing the blood stain on his trousers. The police officers had no way to explain the blood on his pants, as no one else in the party was injured, nor is the victim harmed in any noticeable way that would have caused the sizable stain on his leg. Despite this compelling evidence, the victim declined to release his name to the public, probably out of fear of ridicule. And Charters Towers law enforcement thoroughly searched of every inch of Towers Hill, but found nothing to further corroborate the story. The best they could offer was that perhaps a goat or a kangaroo, both of which are common in the area, had for some reason assaulted the young man. Others suggested that there was some truth to the rumors that hermits dwelled within the old abandoned mining shafts, and that one of these individuals had been responsible for the tiny yaoi sightings that the youths had reported. Neither explanation is satisfactory, so we are left with either a juvenile prank or an actual attack from some strange creature. Suffice to say, a run-in with a yaoi is serious business. I mean, most people freeze or flee when faced with these creatures, but a handful of eyewitnesses are brave enough or foolish enough to fight back. The two following stories are a bit of over the top, but if they are true, they are absolutely fascinating. You be the judge. In 1995, police officers from the small suburb of Lura arrested a member of a biker gang on illegal firearms charges. The officers had been alerted by the biker's neighbors who had reported rapid gunfire in the middle of the night echoing through the New South Wales wilderness. At first glance, it's a mundane story that might play out in any town until you hear the biker's story. Despite being in a gang, the biker was still a country boy and nursed a soft spot for animals. In addition to a pair of vicious attack dogs, the biker also kept a prize-winning goat, his pride and joy. The biker would even take the goat on the livestock competition circuit, where it apparently earned many accolades over the years. The goat was never far from him, staying in the enclosure closest to his home, while the dogs were relegated to the furthest kennels. While lounging in his living room late one night, the biker heard all of his pets, both the goat and the dogs, going absolutely wild in their cages. The scuffle sounded so violent that the biker's first thought was that his greatest fear had been realized. The dogs had gotten to the goat and were ripping it limb from limb. He leapt into action, bolting out the back door. A cacophony greeted him. Thankfully, the dogs were still penned up, but were barking and snarling ferociously in the direction of the goat. The biker's eyes slowly adjusted to the darkness as he focused on the object of their aggression. A man towered in the goat enclosure. The biker took several steps towards the intruder before he realized several key details. The man was tall, standing around seven feet. He seemed to be wearing a fur coat and maybe fur pants as well. It wasn't until the being looked in his direction that the biker realized what he was dealing with. Two blood-red eyes shone with a self-illuminated fire, casting a hellish glow over the goat enclosure. This was no man. It was a yaoi, and his prized goat was on the menu. The biker knew he had only a few moments to react. He raced to the kennel, which was practically being torn apart by the agitated guard dogs. With one swift motion, he unlatched the cage and released the hounds, commanding them to attack. A few athletic bounds closed the distance between the pens, but before the dogs could reach it, the yaoi had leapt over the fence, disappearing through the trees and into the night. His dogs were unafraid of the darkness. They continued their pursuit, barking and growling as they chased the intruder deeper into the bush. The yaoi was in big trouble, the biker thought. These were vicious trained attack dogs which had just been given an order to kill. His confidence shattered, however, as the aggressive barks ascended in pitch, rising to pained squeals of anguish. Just as quickly as they had entered the trees, 
the dogs came back again, tails tucked submissively between their legs. They didn't even cower needily at the biker's feet. They continued straight past where he was standing. Whatever had happened, they wanted to put as much distance as possible between themselves and this monster. The biker didn't have time for this distraction, however. His next priority was the goat, but he wasn't about to venture into the enclosure alone and unarmed. He ran back into his house, fetched his shotgun, and stormed back at once more. Equally terrified and furious, he slowly stepped into the pen, calling the goat's name. His voice echoed in the night, but no sound returned the greeting. No bleeding, no jangle of bells, only the endless drone of crickets. It didn't take long for him to discover what had happened. The goat's carcass lay on the ground, bleeding out. Its head had been torn completely from its neck and was nowhere to be found. Without a word, he left the body in place, deciding to revisit the scene of the incident in the light of day. The next morning, the biker's fear had disappeared. All that was left was a searing anger. His favorite thing in the world had just now been taken from him, and if he couldn't have it back, he could at least make the monster pay for the pain it had now inflicted. The biker hatched a plan. He found a length of heavy chain, hauling it out to the goat enclosure. The body was still there, untouched. What he had to do next would be difficult, maybe even a desecration of his pet's memory. But vengeance trumped sentimentality. The biker took the heavy chain and threaded it through the gaping wounds in the goat's torso, securing it tightly. He then dragged the carcass back over to the edge of the forest, lobbed the opposite end across the limb of a tree, and hauled the entire gruesome affair seven feet in the air. He then securely fastened the free end of the chain in the ground and waited until nightfall. The biker went about his business that day, keeping one eye upon the goat suspended in midair. As the sun began to creep down below the treetops, he went out to fetch his dogs, who had sheepishly returned since the incident the night before. He escorted the animals into his home, dousing the lights from its hiding place. He pulled out a contraband Uzi machine pistol the same weapon that would lead to his arrest the next day. The biker then pulled the chair up to the backyard window and sat watching and waiting as the final orange shafts of sunlight began to fade. This lonesome vigil stretched on for hours until late in the night when the dogs began acting erratically. They could obviously hear something that the biker could not. And soon, the dogs were just as agitated as they had been before, the night before, fighting to get outside. The biker turned his attention to the edge of the woods, and before long, a crashing sound welled up from the forest at last, loud enough to be heard over his dogs. Along with the ominous thrashing appeared the two red eyes emerging from the gloom in the trees. It was tempting in those first moments to rush out the door and give the yowie what it deserved. But the biker had been in numerous scraps before. He knew what the best way to win a fight was to patiently wait for a foolproof window of opportunity. He watched as the shaggy beast stepped out from the woods, sniffing the air. Its eyes shot in the direction of the goat carcass, still hoisted across the limb of a nearby tree. Finally, the yowie was by the goat's body, and the biker leapt into action, flinging open the doors to release his dogs. The animals, however, were much less enthusiastic about fighting once they laid eyes upon the beast. The lessons of the night before were still fresh in their minds. No matter, the biker still had his Uzi. He rushed out the door and took aim at the Yowie, which was so preoccupied with the goat that it hadn't seemed to notice the commotion coming from the house. He ran towards the creature, unloading every last round of ammunition in its direction. As he did so, the blood-red eyes winked out of existence, but he continued firing. The biker paused to catch his breath and dropped his empty weapon, fumbling for the flashlight in his pocket. With shaking hands, he flicks it on, shining its beam in the direction of the carcass, but there's nothing there. Not only was the creature missing, but so were the remains of the goat. There were no signs of blood on the ground either. The only thing that remained was the heavy chain still swaying from its branch. The next day, law enforcement arrived to arrest the biker. And maybe he was a poor shot, maybe the yaoi was, like indigenous tribes claim, more spirit than animal. Maybe, perhaps most likely, the biker just invented this story in a last-ditch attempt to escape the blame for possessing his firearm. 
I'll let you be the judge. Another, slightly more believable Yaoi confrontation unfolded halfway between Brisbane, as the locals say, and the Gold Coast near the community of Orma, Queensland. In mid-2003, a number of aggressive Yaoi sightings had arisen in the area, and somehow, the Australian Yowie Research Group enlisted the aid of Special Air Service Regiment personnel. Their goal was to frighten the Yowie so it would no longer endanger residents. What followed was essentially a two-day-long Special Ops Yowie mission through its status as an official engagement, or whether it happened at all remains dubious. According to the report, two soldiers arrived on site on October 10th and set into the bush just off of Baron Joey Drive the epicenter of Yowie activity. While more populous today, the area was still quite heavily forested in 2003. The weather was windy and cloudy as they set up camp along a stretch of steep, sloped bushland. There was plenty of tree cover for the fauna to hide. Although, aside from the occasional kangaroo or fox footprint, there was no sign of animal life. One of the two men set up an observation and sniping post with a good view of the surrounding area. He was armed with a rifle and his personal pistol, and even decked out in a ghillie suit to hide his appearance. He surveyed the area for several hours before dinner time rolled around. His companion, having scouted the area around camp, returned to light a small fire. As they cooked their meal, the soldiers noticed the sound of twigs snapping in the distance. Looking through his scope, one of these soldiers determined it was a fox, drawn in by the scent of dinner cooking over the campfire, not a yowie. But, if the fox knew they were there and was looking for scraps, maybe something else did as well. The soldiers were determined to remain awake all night. As the hours stretched on into the early morning, bits of activity caught their attention here and there. And around 1.15 a.m., something loud and heavy approached the soldiers' camp, but the overcast weather had rendered their night vision scopes ineffective for the time being. Whatever it may have been, both agree that it sounded large and had come unnervingly close. But it wasn't until around 4.30 in the morning that activity really picked up. One of these soldiers had fallen asleep, but the other reported a large sapling that was torn to the ground in the goalie below, accompanied by a deafening thump and intimidating roar. The soldier who had been asleep quickly took position, firearm at the ready, as they waited and listened. At dawn, the second soldier investigated the area where the sounds had originated and discovered a large dead tree that had been broken and scattered across the ground. There were no footprints, fresh gouges marked nearby tree trunks seven feet above the forest floor. Their first night behind them, the soldiers napped in shifts in preparation for their second evening. The forest remained unnaturally quiet for most of the day. It was time for phase two of their operation. These soldiers secured the perimeter around the campsite, installing four rattle traps, three illumination flares, and a trio of tripped flashbangs, predominantly focused on the rear of their position, where they had felt the most vulnerable. A final check around dusk, the second night, assured them that they were prepared for whatever came their way. Dinner came and went as nighttime crept into the forest, and at last, around 9.30 p.m., contact was established. The silence was broken by the sound of heavy movement along the edge of camp. Both soldiers swept the area with their night vision and confirmed that they were seeing the same thing. It was a seven-foot-tall figure just 50 yards into the forest, slowly moving on two legs in and out of sight among the trees. Both soldiers switched the safeties off their weapons and regrouped. As they watched, they slowly grew more and more certain that they had found what they had been looking for. In their report, these soldiers stated that, at no time did I or we believe what we saw was a human being. For 45 minutes, the pair of soldiers observed these strange shapes on and off in the woods, at one point smelling the beast's sulfurous odor. At first, it seemed curious. Later, the soldiers told researchers that they believed the creature had decided there was only one of them present. Only then did they sense it shift into a more predatory attitude. To their amazement, the creatures seemed to expertly navigate the rattle traps they had set up, stepping around them as carefully as if it had placed them itself. Had it been watching them this whole time from the forest as they set up their defenses? If it had, then it didn't see everything they had done, because around 10.15, the shape set off one of their flashbangs. 
The entire forest lit up with blinding light for a split second before plunging into darkness once more, taking the soldiers by surprise. Their own night vision was ruined as blobs of colorful afterglow smeared their vision. Before the soldiers' eyesight had recovered, another flashbang was triggered, and howls of rage and violent thrashing filled the bush. According to the soldiers, the Yowie screams were difficult to describe, but resembled a deep, rumbling screech with a high pitch at the end, like a very big, enraged pig, or like a deeper chimpanzee noise that you hear in documentaries. It must have been terrifying, hearing these noises while completely blind, with no sense of how close the creature was. At last, these soldiers had regained their vision, just enough to see the figure clearer than ever before. It was indeed a Yowie, likely a male, darting through the trees. Now afraid for their lives, these soldiers had opened fire to frighten the animal away, neither wasteful nor restrained with their shots. The Yowie fell back to the safety of the forest. Both soldiers dropped their rifles and unholstered their handguns, launching a pursuit of the creature, following its loud retreat through the underbrush. The chase lasted nearly two hours, with the sounds stopping from time to time as if the creature was standing its ground, challenging them. The noises would invariably start up again, leading them further into the bush before reappearing on another side, flanking the soldiers. At one point, they lobbed two more flashbangs onto the front and went to the rear. After they detonated, aggressive shaking and crashing filled the trees around them. Despite this intimidating show of force, the Yowie only yielded ground reluctantly. One of the soldiers later remarked, Imagine anything else having two armed blokes in pursuit, with loud bangs and gunfire. Anything or anybody else would have been long gone, but this thing seemed like we had to really force it every step. I don't like to think if it had actually been able to flank us, or if we were unarmed. Slowly but surely, however, the sounds of the creature faded as they continued their pursuit. The Yowie had given up, and they were falling behind. The soldiers at last lobbed their two remaining flashbangs in the direction of the noises, Hopefully, their work was done. These soldiers returned to camp knowing they had made their best effort to ensure that the Yowie would no longer terrorize residents. A subsequent sweep of the area in the light of day revealed that not only had they failed to hit the creature, but that it had not left behind any recognizable footprints. Despite their training, the soldiers were absolutely unnerved by the experience, saying that they were pretty shaken the whole time. We just relied on our professionalism and experience to carry on. Believe me, a couple of times we just wanted to lay down, suppressing fire and haul out of there. I'm still wishing that I had taken the M40 with me on the pursuit, as if I had, I most probably would have dropped the creature. It was probably one of the scariest few hours I've ever experienced. Both soldiers declined to file an official report with the respected agency. So, more importantly, what do you guys think? Let me know what you think about this episode and the content inside in the comments down below. I would love to know your opinions. As always, guys, if you're new to the channel and enjoy what you see, be sure to go ahead and smack that big old red subscribe button and be sure to go ahead and hit the like button. Keep an open mind, you guys. I love you all, and I'll see you guys in the next episode.